Welcome everyone. Hello, hello. Today is a busy day at the Museum of Russian Art. It is Friday, June 25th, and uh, we'd like to welcome you to today's virtual opening of two new exhibitions here at the museum. We are doing something a little bit different because normally an opening would happen, you know, the, the, these exhibitions open tomorrow, the 26th. Uh, so we thought we'd give you all, our audience listening today, and those that are listening after this event has passed on the recordings, uh, some information on what you will see when you come to the galleries. It's great. It's a great resource to be able to listen to the curator talk about the, the thought process that came, went into the exhibitions. You'll be able to glimpse the galleries. You can already see the galleries behind both Masha and myself. Uh, we want to give you plenty of information and plenty of imagery and really entice you to come to the galleries as well if you're able to. We are open seven days a week and we are thrilled that we've been seeing so many visitors. Um, it's just been a really lively summer already. So with that, I want you to keep in mind that as things have opened up, we will be starting live events. Um, we do have a VIP reception to open this exhibition tonight. Um, you can learn more about being a part of the circle that does things like that. It's called the Russian Arts and Culture Society. You can find that um, on our website. It's a certain giving level and we love to do special tours and special opportunities for that group. We also do the same thing for our members. And if you are a member of the Museum of Russian Art, look for an announcement for a special concert that's going to be available to you first on July 24th. But there's more coming and we're excited to have you in the galleries or virtually, whatever works for you, we are excited to reach out to you. So today we are gonna be going an hour. You will have the opportunity to ask questions if you like. Simply enter the question into the chat box. Um, we usually, I will look at them throughout the program and we save those questions till the end. So um, we'll go about 45 minutes and then we'll do question and answer. So with that, thank you for supporting the Museum of Russian Art. You can look into being a member or any other level of giving through the website. Keep in mind that we also have a beautiful museum shop that is available online and of course um, on the mezzanine level in our museum, of course, too. So I should tell you who I am. I'm Michelle Massey. I am the Director of Public Programs at the Museum of Russian Art. And I'm thrilled to bring my colleague to uh, present during this program today. She is the curator and head of collections and exhibitions here at the museum. She's been here for uh, almost 13 years and has curated over 50 exhibitions um, and is a wellspring of knowledge, has so much work and inspiration under her belt. And she and I greatly enjoy doing these programs together. So I hope you have a good time with us today. Let me welcome to our program, Dr. Masha Zavialova. Uh, good day, everyone. And um, today we are introducing two new exhibitions. And right away, uh, you can see our main gallery behind me. And right away, let me start sharing my screen so that you can be in the galleries uh, together with me. And uh, I want to show you today, I want to start our virtual opening in a very unusual way. So I would like to show you what the galleries look uh, like right now. This is how they look. It's the last day of the installation. So if you come to the museum right after our virtual opening today, after two o'clock, that's what you will see. Well, it will be different because things are moving all the time. And I would like to show you what's actually happening. I made a very short video just 20 minutes ago. And you can see that the work is in full swing. This is our collections associate, our installation specialist, Jenny Tyson, uh, Lydia, our intern, and even Mary Burke from the store is here helping. Uh, so that's how the museum looks right now, but it will look 
speak and span ready to open by five o'clock tonight. We are putting finishing touches to the two new shows that I'm really very excited about. And uh, one of them in the main gallery that you, you saw our installation team working on is called uh, Alexei Bradovich, designer of the avant-garde. Uh, so that's how part of the gallery looks where we don't have ladders and working tables and people installing. So part of it you see is already uh, installed and ready to go. Uh, this is what you will see when you enter the gallery on your left, a little icon. It's the earliest work that we have on display created by Alexei Bradovich and let me start talking about who this person is and why we are exhibiting him and presenting his work uh, at our museum. First of all, <clears throat> I would like to thank our collector and uh, uh, consulting curator for the show, Kurt Lund, who is an assistant professor at Hamlin University. Uh, his area is graphic design and for many years uh, he was, uh, has been indeed interested in the work of this designer, Alexei Brandovich. Alexei Brandovich uh, comes from Russia, although he was born in Belarus, and that's the connection that is a link between our main gallery's exhibition and the exhibition upstairs on the mezzanine level, where we have works of artists from Belarus. Uh, he was born into the family of a wealthy doctor. Uh, eventually they moved to St. Petersburg where Alexei went to the Tanishev school. Uh, it's one of the um, early 20th century schools in Imperial St. Petersburg that really attracted a great body of teachers and students. Uh, Osip Mandelstam and uh, Vladimir Nabokov went to school there. Nabokov actually went to the tennis school when Bradovich was a student there. And incidentally, the building where the school is located on Mojave Street is where I worked, went through the same doors for about, se uh, about seven, seven years between the birth of my first and second daughter when I lived in St. Petersburg. So I know this building very well. Uh, Bradovich was six, uh, very young when the war started, but he was inspired to defend his country. He ran away from home to the front, was returned back home, and then was sent to a military cadet school. Also, initially, before the war, he and his family, especially his mother, wanted him, and he himself wanted to go to the Imperial Academy of Arts. He wanted to be an artist from the start but the war changed the course of his life. And uh, he returned to the front as a young officer and fought in the uh, First World War and in the Civil War. He was wounded, sent to the uh, a town of Kislovodsk in Southern Russia. At that time, the Red Army was already pushing the White Army down to the south, to the Black Sea. Uh, Alexei uh, went to Novorossiysk from Kislovodsk. Uh, on the way, he met his wife, Nina, the wife of all of his years, all of his life. And they had to leave the country uh, across the Black Sea to Constantinople. That was the usual way for uh, the White Army officers and other uh, Russian <clears throat> Uh, people who belong to, who opposed the new regime to emigrate. From Constantinople, to, he went to Paris. Uh, he was still very young. He was born in 1898. So in 1920, he was 22 when he moved to Paris with his family, young wife, uh, not a single penny or whatever the currency was in France at that time in his pocket. He uh, had to start looking for a job. And one of the, he began to do all kinds of small jobs. One of the jobs that he found, and he kind of knew people and belonged to that circle of uh, young, uh, creative, white Russian emigrants in Paris. 
uh, he, be, he found a job with Ballet Russe, with Diaghilev, and began to paint backdrops uh, for the famous Ballet Russe performances of Sergei Diaghilev. Uh, he was literally painting backdrops, not designing, just working as a painter. While he worked uh, at the Ballet Russe, which provided some income for him, he began to do all kinds of commissions and designs. And look at this screen. Now we are going to go through our slides fairly quickly because we have a lot to cover today. Uh, this is the poster that he designed for the Union of Russian Emigre Artists in Paris in 1924. It was a fundraising event with a reception which was called the Bal Banal 1924 and uh, you can see it was actually a, a contest of posters he got the first prize and who do you think got the second prize you can see here on your left uh, it was Pablo Picasso and you can see his drawings that was inserted into the program of Bal Banal we have it on display as well in the museum so this launched his career um, and uh, he began to receive commissions to do all kinds of designs. So here you can see part of the program that's on display uh, in our main gallery. So you can see the signature of Picasso here. So his uh, drawing was included into the program for the event of 1924, the Union of Russian Artists. Uh, and uh, Alexei Bradovich began to get commissions. There was no job that he would refuse to do. And he did commercial advertisement. He did book illustrations. Uh, he did the magazine uh, design, fashion design, uh, a lot of commercial uh, designs as well. So this is a poster for a beer company. Bradovich moved to um, Philadelphia to the US in 1930. And this, when you look at the dates, this is a good uh, um, kind of guideline for you. So between 1920 and 1930, all the works you see on display come from Paris. After 1930, uh, uh, when he moved to the US, that is his American period of life. He moved back to uh, France uh, later in his life in the late 1960s when he was already very sick and he died in France in 1971. But at that time he pra practically did uh, no work in design. Although Pradovich uh, did not associate himself with avant-garde or constructivism or suprematism or ab abstract art or fauvism or whatever other movements um, were at that time uh, current in Europe, early 20th century, but he clearly was influenced by avant-garde artists, by mod modern modernist art, by modernism. And uh, here you can see his poster, which says, uh, has one word, graphism. Graphism is graphic design in French, a, a useful word to know, looking at Bradovich's uh, designs. And behind me, you can see this large sticker uh, on the wall that we uh, produced ourselves. The original illust illustration is just the magazine size. It's a small illustration for publication of art a Métier Graphique, uh, a French publication, July 1930. But because uh, his designs lend themselves to be produced large, they are beautiful and very contemporary and modern. That's why we decided to do enlargements of some of his designs and produce these large stickers, uh, the size of our baffle wall that you see behind me. They really add a lot to the overall view uh, look of that exhibition. Bradovich also did um, book illustrations. And here you can see uh, his beautiful uh, illustration for John Milton's 1688 work, A Brief History of Muscovia. 
we know John Milton for his Paradise Lost, but we don't know this book probably. A few people know, I'm sure some people do. There are a lot of Milton specialists, a brief history of Muscovy. And we have more than one illustration uh, from this book. 1928, the book, uh, Monsieur de Bougrelon, a French novel that you will see a lot of illustrations and you see clearly how modernist, how very contemporary Alexei Bradovich was in his uh, book illustrations as well. La Sultane de l'Amour, French, 1927. Uh, oriental motifs in this uh, uh, Islamic uh, motif in, in this book. Uh, he moved to the US, to Philadelphia, to start teaching at a school there, the um, Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art in Philadelphia, 1930. Uh, but his skills and his talent in indeed as a designer was uh, soon noticed. Uh, actually, he was invited to the US to bring some European modernist contemporary uh, trends to American graphic design. And so his skills were in demand and um, very soon uh, the editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar, Carmel Snow, noticed his work, hired him on the spot the moment she met him. And from 1934 to 1958, he was the art director of Harper's Bazaar. And here in this position, he revolutionized uh, magazine design, fashion design as we know it. And sometimes when we look at contemporary magazines and ads and commercials, we don't even know how much we owe to the talent and inno innovation, innovative spirit of Bradovich's work. Um, so this is also a beer uh, ad from 1933. Uh, here are some uh, designs for magazines here and 1934-37, so when he was uh, working already at Harper's Bazaar. He still did a lot of commercial design. And this is for the M Climax Molybdenum company. Molybdenum is a metal. So it's a company uh, making these uh, uh, molybdenum alloys for all kinds of uh, industrial, uh, industrial construction and industrial uh, products. Uh, you see, uh, so the central one, we have it on our banner, uh, quite strikingly modernist and constructivist, even though Bratovich would probably not himself acknowledge this and would not be uh, agreeing to us calling them a constructivist and an avant-garde artist, but he certainly was, if not in name, then in spirit. And this poster we turned also into a sticker. And to my mind, it reminds me of early constructivist Soviet posters and ads so much. So 1934, New Jersey Zinc Company, another of his um, uh, commercial ads. In uh, 1935, 38, when the Ballet Russe uh, began to do American tours, he did a book of photography that was extremely influential as all of his work. Um, and uh, we are showing, we actually from, uh, have two books from our collector and contributed to the show and consulting curator, Professor Lund. Uh, he shared two books and we show these two different spreads. He was really, um, in very innovative in how in how he began to do photography, black and white photography, uh, showing, trying to show motion and movement and dynamism, creating all kinds of effects. So these photographs are not quite uh, realistic in the sense they don't show us the actual scene as we see it, but 
as we would see it in the theater, but probably uh, just showing the dynamism and uh, the movements of ballet dancers. Uh, and now uh, I would like to show you some uh, illustrations from his Harper's Bazaar, just to show you what he did. You know, a very generous use of blank space, and sometimes he would be accused of just wasting space of the magazine. But uh, the magazine really was uh, entered into its golden, golden period, uh, golden years of, of the um, how the magazine began to look with this radical design and radical approach to how uh, the art director Alexey Bradovich used text and fonts and the shapes of the text columns and uh, these photographs, how he incorporated them into this one single, very impressive flow of texts and images. We just have one uh, design in uh, hard copy in uh, this exhibition, but we have a very nice slideshow of Harper's Bazaar designs. We decided to go virtual with this part of the exhibition. And you will see these in the apps in, uh, this is Bradovich in his young years. And this is one of the uh, photographs uh, from Harper's Bazaar that you are going to see in our slideshow. And now, I hope you are inspired enough to look, uh, to check up this exhibition of this very innovative pioneering graphic designer. And now I would like us to go upstairs and look at our mezzanine gallery, Belarusian paintings from traditionalism to contemporary expression. First of all, let's look at where Belarus is because not probably not everyone knows where exactly the country is uh, situated on the map of Europe. Uh, Belarus is a landlocked country. And you can see that it borders on Russia uh, from the east. South is Ukraine, then Poland and Lithuania and Latvia. Uh, Belarus uh, briefly to cover its history was first part uh, of uh, the Kievan Rus between 9th and 13th century, then it, in, it went into to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and in the Middle Ages all this part of Europe was uh, Lithuanian and Polish. Then Lithuania and Poland united into the uh, commonwealth of the two countries with, I think, Poland uh, very dominant in, in this union. And uh, then wars happened and Poland was divided between Austria, Prussia and Russia. And after the third partition of Poland under Catherine the Great, Belarus uh, went uh, to the Russian empire. During the revolution, there was a very short time, uh, literally 19, probably just a few months of independence. And then Belarus became a Soviet Republic. And uh, finally in 1991, Belarus became an independent country probably for the first time, uh, say, uh, except for that very short period after the revolution of 1917. Uh, so since 1991, Belarus has been an independent country ruled by one president from 1994. So it's a republic, but it seems that uh, elections are stalling in Belarus and they keep electing the same president for many, many years. Since 1924, well, it's already 28 years, same uh, president, which is uh, what the country has. And uh, 
now we will look at eight artists uh, in our exhibition. They come from a private American collection. And uh, let me just say a couple of words about why we say Belarus or Belarus sometimes. In the Soviet times, uh, the common pronunciation in English, I believe, was Belarus, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. That was the official name. The language was Belarusian. Everything was Belarusian. But after the independence, uh, the country adopted the name of Belarus to probably get rid of the Russia part in Belarus because now it's an independent country, Belarus. And the adjective from that noun is Belarusian or Belarusian. And that's how we call this country now. So if you refer to the country as Belarus or Belarusian, that would be from the Soviet period between 1919, when the Belarusian Republic was formed in 1991. But now it is Belarus. Uh, the exhibition is very lovely. I really enjoy the art and uh, we show eight artists. The subtitle of the show is From Traditionalism to Contemporary Expression. And uh, in this show, you can see a, a range of styles from Belarus Belarusian artists. We are not claiming to cover the uh, entire Belarusian art of the, five, of the past four or five decades, uh, because it's infinitely more uh, richer and broader, of course. But we have a nice, nice selection of uh, Belarusian artists, Belarusian artists, sorry. Yeah, I learned to pronounce the word Belarusian Russian when I was living in the Soviet Union. So it's, uh, I'm sorry if I sometimes will be confusing the two words. Um, yeah, so we have a very nice selection of Belarusian artists with uh, that uh, we're going to look at. Leonid Shemilov is probably the most well-known artist in our exhibition from Belarus. Uh, he was the honored and people's artist of uh, the Belarusian Soviet Republic. He was the chairman of the Belarusian Artists Union. He received state prizes, really a very recognized artist born in Vitebsk. Here is how uh, our exhibition looks and uh, you see that probably thinking about Belarusian art and knowing its contemporary history, one would think that uh, we are going to encounter a lot of gloominess and a lot of socialist realism uh, if we talk about Belarus. But in fact, these paintings are striking in how much light and color and beauty they have. And of course, this uh, photograph that you see does not do justice to the show or to these paintings at all. It's just a screen, just a photograph to enjoy brushwork of a real painting, an actual painting. Uh, and most of these paintings are oil paintings. You need to see them in person, experience the aura of uh, an original brushwork and painting. Leonid Shemilov was our, in Belarusian, it should be pronoun, pronounced as Shamilov, was born in the town of Vitebsk in 1923. At that time, Vitebsk, and this painting that you see uh, here on your screens is called Vitebsk. And uh, clearly, probably, uh, the earlier years, probably the years of, uh, Shemilov's youth when he was growing up in Vitebsk in the 1920s and 1930s. Vitebsk is a very special place in the history of world art indeed, and in the history of uh, contemporary avant-garde movements. Uh, 
and right after the revolution, Vitebsk became the hub, of, in a way, uh, one of the European and indeed world centers of the most innovative art known uh, at that time and throughout the 20th century. Uh, Mark Chagall was born near Vitebsk and uh, he lived in Vitebsk and in 1970, after 1917, uh, he was actually the commissar for the arts or commissioner, actually in Russian it would be the commissar for the arts for the entire Vitebsk region and he opened uh, the People's Art School here in Vitebsk. It was free of charge, free for all, open to all ages and all genders. And he invited uh, the very prominent contemporary artists to teach there. One of them was Kazimir Malevich. Malevich came to Vitebsk and here he established his famous Unovis group, champion, champion, champions of new art. Uh, El Lisitsky uh, also uh, lived here and uh, was part of that group of artists uh, around Mark Chagall's school. Mikhail Bakhtin and those who studied uh, or took any kind of uh, courses in contemporary literary studies would know this name. Mikhail Bakhtin is a world known uh, literary scholar and philosopher who contributed to our knowledge of what a text, a literary text is about to a great deal. And uh, also uh, his insights are really important, still studied, widely studied and used by contemporary scholars in humanities. And no wonder Leonid Shemilov never became a traditional socialist realist artist as we know that art. So socialist realism was the official art of the Soviet era uh, that was intended to instill uh, socialist values and promote uh, the, uh, or inculcate, educate the public in the virtues of the socialist Soviet specifically system. Leonid Shemilov uh, created a lot of uh, beautiful townscapes of the uh, cities, uh, Belarusian cities where he lived. And he, most of his life, he moved to Minsk eventually from Vitebsk. Uh, he studied in Minsk in the Minsk College of Art and the uh, Belarusian or Belarusian, uh, it was called at that time, uh, Institute for Theater Arts. And that was the main school. It was not just for the theater. There was a department of art and design in that school. And a lot of uh, well-known and prominent Belarusian artists graduated from, from this school. Uh, so you see uh, Leonid Shemilov's paintings are not uh, part of that social realism as we know it. And especially interesting uh, he is his, uh, the way he treats the form, the way he finds form in his paintings, kind of simplified, probably resembling some paintings of the severe style from the 60s. And also his very uh, skilled and imaginative use of black color. I find the way he uses black in his paintings quite fascinating. Um, uh, so some of uh, the, uh, we have quite a number of paintings by Leonid Shemilov and uh, I'm sure that we, you, you will enjoy his art. He's really a wonderful, outstanding artist of his time. We also have uh, paintings by his daughter and Leonid Shemilov uh, raised children to, love art and be like himself artists. So Ludmila and her sister Margarita are both artists and Ludmila's husband and her daughter are artists. So it's uh, a family of artists that we are talking about here. But Ludmila chose a very different path uh, than her dad. 
She graduated also from the Minsk College of Art in 1979. I'm not sure she went to, to the uh, Belarusian or Belarusian Institute of Theater Arts or Academy of Theater Arts. But right after graduating from the Minsk College of Art, she began to exhibit and he, she chose quite a different painting style and a different approach to how she created art. Uh, sometimes her style is referred to as naive or modern naive style. Uh, naive art is, uh, you can see naive art in uh, the art histories of many, many countries, notably Henri Rousseau from France, part of the Impressionist and po post-Impressionist milieu, uh, very famous, and uh, Grandma Moses, I believe, and many, many other uh, naive artists. But there are two approaches or two kinds of naive art. Sometimes this art is created by untrained but very talented artists. But sometimes professional artists choose this style as a conscious, deliberate choice. And this is what Ludmila Shemilova is, I believe, because she's a trained artist. And uh, the naive art, art as a deliberate, as a conscious choice is always intended to um, I shouldn't say always intended because nothing is always in art and we don't know what was initially intended because we have no access to artists' minds and sometimes they are not aware of themselves. They wouldn't be uh, able to express in words what they do and did and why they arrived at, at this or that choice. Because um, as uh, Ludmilla's father said, Art is visual music, cannot be expressed in words. So it's a different kind of uh, creative endeavor. It's not literature. So uh, all we, when we talk about art, it's always our interpretation. They are translating art into a different genre, into a different kind of artistic expression, which is a uh, spoken word, I believe, in my in my uh, case. So uh, Ludmilla chose naive art as a, as a conscious deliberate stand to probably oppose the conventions of a traditional classical academic art that required artists to be very realist, study nature, excel in the technique of painting and light and shadow and perspective and all of these technical skills that uh, realist, um, indeed professional artists are supposed to master. Her paintings are full of uh, good natured humor and sometimes irony. Ludmilla also um, in recent years began to introduce oppositional political messages uh, in, into her work. So sometimes she paints, um, uh, she, we don't have this work by her, unfortunately, in our collection here on display. Sometimes she would introduce characters uh, with uh, uh, the, um, a different kind of flag, white and red, the flag of the opposition in uh, contemporary Belarus uh, versus the red and green official flag of uh, the Republic of Belarus, and she does all kinds of uh, little oppositional ironic uh, uh, inclusions into her recent paintings. Uh, this painting is called The Parallel Universe, The Sleepless Night. Uh, I absolutely adore her paintings, this selection that we have on display. Uh, they are very, very charming. Sleep, my little prince. Uh, in Russian, it's uh, called Spimaya Radist. And this is clearly a quote from this famous lullaby, presumably uh, composed by Mozart, but in fact, by another German composer. And in German, the lullaby is called uh, Schlafen mein Prinzchen, which is in English would be sleep, my little prince. And that's how 
I chose to translate this title so that the reference to the lullaby is quite clear. I'm sure when the artist painted this painting, she had the sound of that beautiful music in mind. And so the title would remind people who know this lullaby and a lot of us know it. It's the music, if I played it, you would recognize it right away. Uh, you would know it. Alexander de Sujev is on the other side, other extreme of the uh, art spectrum that we show here. Dosuzhev was a nonconformist during the Soviet period. He was one of the founding members of the Quadrat group. And Quadrat uh, was established in Vitebsk, the hub of early Soviet avant-garde of the early 1920s. And uh, Quadrat was established in 1987. It was an oppositional group of artists, nonconformists, who sought to keep the traditions of Vitebsk avant-garde alive. Uh, and Alexander Dosuzhev was very much very active member of the Quadrat group. Quadrat means square in Russian. Uh, and uh, the name of the group referred to the Black Square by Malevich. And actually the first exhibition that the group did in 1998 was called Experiment. And it was dedicated to 110th anniversary of Kazimir Malevich. After uh, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, Dasuzhev came up with his own art concept, which is called PLIP. Uh, that's the abbreviation of surface, uh, surface of space, line, and spot. And he believes that everything in a painting is centered on these three concepts, surface, line, and spot. Surface or space as the uh, represents or as a representative of uh, being and infinity. Line is something that breaks, it creates a rupture where new things show and spot, a color spot, a color stain is uh, a, a sort of a cosmic egg from which new life springs. So a very interesting uh, art philosophy of Alexander. The Sujo, we have three paintings on display by this artist and this here clearly you see uh, his uh, concept, his philosophy of surface line and uh, color spot as the cosmic egg reflected in this painting. Anatoly Zoitko, he was often referred to as a post symbolist and his paintings are full of uh, symbols and references to the historical, philosophical and literary heritage globally, not just Belarusian, but quite often he uses the Belarusian uh, folk tales and legends and stories of the past. This painting is called the Apple Feast of the Savior, or uh, it would be called Apple Spas or Apple Savior, referring to the holiday of transfiguration in August, when in Russian Orthodox churches, people bring apples to the church to bless, and no fruit is supposed to be eaten before that, and starting from the blessing of the apples, uh, uh, people begin to eat uh, apples, which is uh, stands to reason because mid-August it's still a little bit too early for Russia and Belarus being northern countries to eat apples. And this painting is called Tukhrutsky. Um, it's dedicated to the artist Ivan Hrutsky, the artist of the 19th century who lived in Polotsk. Polotsk is in Belarus, and it's also a native town where um, the artist Anatoly Zoitko was born. Yeah, Anatoly Zoitko. So you see his paintings always contain some kind of a story and a reference. And this painting, you see a flying woman 
probably a little bit of a reminiscence of Chagall's flying people. So um, the quite often uh, Belarusian art, artists would refer to the famous uh, countryman, Vladimir Kozhov. You see uh, how every artist in our exhibition has its own recognizable style. Everyone is different. Kozhov uh, was also a professional artist and many of these artists that we have on display were actually chairman of their local artist unions during the Soviet times and after that. Uh, so uh, Kozhov created this very imaginative, beautiful compositions uh, of female portrayals and kind of expressive, very imaginative style. This painting is called uh, the dowry. But let's look at this painting uh, again. So after 1986, Vladimir Kozhov, uh, together with a group of artists, uh, went to Chernobyl, to the zone, about a year after the explosion of the nuclear reactor, the biggest uh, nuclear disaster of the 20th century and probably ever. So he worked in the zone and uh, later uh, created a series of paintings uh, dedicated to the Chernobyl disaster. And what were, impressed him most when he was in the zone were people and abandoned villages. And he wrote that once uh, he was at the checkpoint and an old woman came to the checkpoint from the other side and she said to the soldier, oh, please let me in, uh, my village is over there. And the soldier did not let her in because he couldn't. Uh, he was prohibited. The order was not to let anyone in unless they had a, a special pass. But he told her, listen, uh, grandma, you know how to get to your house. <laughs> because of course these people, it's a wooded area and local people knew how to get to their houses and a lot of them went back to their villages without any permission and just stayed there in their homes where they spent all their life and that impressed the artist so much that he kind of changed his style and began to paint these people um, uh, of the Chernobyl area and this painting uh, most likely it's from 1989 comes from that series of Chernobyl. Robert Landarsky, one of the few artists uh, in our exhibition that are still around, he was born in 1936 and he's a landscape artist. We have a lot of landscapes and one uh, painting, uh, we don't have a lot of portraits here, but this one, A Day in the Country by Robert Landarsky probably reminded him of his childhood. His father was the chairman of a collective farm. And although Landarsky himself lived in the city of Gomel, his father often took him to his farm and made them, and he had a brother work in the fields, help him. And probably this, um, his childhood left him with the beautiful memories of Belarusian countryside. And uh, he began to create this very colorful, lovely, lovely landscapes of uh, the Belarusian countryside. Alexander Solovyov, he was a well-known abstract art creator, even in the Soviet times. His art was prohibited. He was not exhibited. When he tried to exhibit, the exhibitions were closed. So he experienced quite a lot of pressure from the artist union to create art that was more conforming to the requirements of Soviet art. But he kept uh, doing what he thought was best for him as an artist. And we have two paintings of this um, quite rare uh, art on display in our galleries. And the last but not the least, Oleg Skovorodko with his beautiful, beautiful brushwork of four small landscapes on display 
in our galleries. And this is our last slide that we are going to see. Let me stop sharing my screen and uh, I will be ready to take questions if there are any. I think you're great, Masha. I think that uh, you've covered quite a lot of ground and we are having such a busy day today. It's been great to go through and reflect on everything that you that we have in the galleries. Um, I just want to mention um, for those of you that are watching that, um, you know, you see the Belarusian paintings behind me, you see the Brodovich behind Masha, a little bit of a glance. Um, there will be prints and cards available in the shop as well. Um, and, you know, it's, I think um, what we always want to impress upon uh, all of you watching that uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to learn about the artists and the work. And it's just uh, this, these shows in particular are fantastic to see in person, wouldn't you say, Masha? I mean, that's always the case. Yeah, a lot of these are oil paintings and uh, some of them come from Soviet, the Soviet era or late 20th century, a lot from the beginning of the 21st century and all paintings, especially these artists, many of them used very, very lovely brushwork using a lot of paint and mm -hmm. very uh, just lovely brushwork that you need to see in person. Yes. It's not just the stories that these paintings uh, convey, but also the skill of the artist and the actual, the painterly, pictorial quality mm -hmm. of these paintings that are very enjoyable to the eye. Just the combination of colors and compositions and um, the effects or light effects and how colors combine together uh, in these paintings. Actually, one of the artists, and we are going to add this information to the show, I think it was uh, probably Landarsky. He taught us how to look at art and we will put this quote from him into the exhibition. He said, when I look at a painting, I examine the composition first. So the composition is where everything is located mm -hmm. and the foreground, background, middle ground, the sides. Uh, and uh, then he says, then I look for the pictorial quality, the energy and the movement of the brushwork. Then comes the color palette, only in the third place. And we often notice the color first, or we notice stories first. And he says that each color should contribute to other colors showing at their best. So not just separate colors, he believed in this communion of colors when they share and they present each other uh, to, to the best. So they serve the service of colors in each painting. And, uh, and then he says, of course, the last but not the least is uh, the overall harmony of a painting, how, mm. well, how well coheres is it together. That's beautiful. Yeah. Quite. So I, I'll put this quote from Robert Landarsky in our text for the exhibition and probably some people will benefit from it and learn how artists look at art. Certainly. So in addition to this resource, when you come visit us and see this work, uh, we also have audio tour stops that are available throughout the museum where you'll be able to call on your cell phone um, and listen to 60 to 90 seconds more information about some of the works. So that's another um, added bonus to coming. I think we should um, take an opportunity to reflect and thank our wonderful team here at the museum. We are small but mighty and everyone has such a big role and they're out working while we're sitting at our desks right now. So I know that you want to thank the installation team. Yeah, I actually started my uh, virtual yes. opening today, remember showing, showing them. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really very, very grateful uh, to them. We're installing two new exhibitions at the same time. And next week, we're going to install a small exhibition, actually seven cases at the airport, Terminal mm -hmm. 1. So mm -hmm. people who are traveling will be able to see some pieces 
uh, three-dimensional art, samovars and some other objects of folk art and some nesting dolls from our collection at the airport. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank our installation team again, uh, Ginny Tyson, Michael Watts, uh, Lydia Brownwell and uh, Andrew and Evan Wesselman who- And Teresa not, Nelson. Uh, and Teresa Nelson, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Teresa is here today, Evan and Andrew uh, had some other things, uh, uh, they are not here today, but uh, I'm really grateful to the team, they do a wonderful, wonderful work, and also we have a lot of other people who are involved in exhibitions. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Koshel and Peterson uh, publishers that published our brochures, mm -hmm. uh, we have Tim, Tim Piper, who uh, created uh, didactics and printed them. Well, we create them, in, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he does always does a wonderful job printing. And he created the sticker, Dave Peterson, who did some vinyls and uh, our facilities manager, Mark Pierce, mm -hmm. uh, who also participates in the life of the museum. And of course, my colleague, uh, uh, Michelle Massey, uh, Mary Burke that you saw in my little video from the store mm -hmm. and um, our accountant, uh, Linda Teal. And mm -hmm. of course, again, last but not least, our director, Mark Meister, who yes. keeps us all going. Yes, absolutely. Did, did I forget anyone? And I again, so. Kurt Land, I hope uh, Kurt, uh, who is the consulting curator and mm -hmm. contributor to the show, I, ho I hope that uh, he's on his way to uh, a different state, but I hope that he is or will be listening to this presentation. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, the collection mm -hmm. of Radovich that uh, he put together is really remarkable. It really is. So with that, thank you for joining us today. This is being recorded. So we'll be posting it on our website under our virtual event archive. There will be more um, probably virtual events um, around this work, perhaps with uh, hopefully with Dr. Kurt Lund, but you'll see those announcements coming up. Look for some wonderful events. We have, uh, like I said, there's something coming on sip, or I'm sorry, July 24th. We'll be letting members know of a special concert happening. happening. So if you want to become a member, you'll know first, and then we will be doing Russian um, Russian Art After Dark, which is a Friday night party in the galleries on July 30th. And from there, we'll just see where it goes. We've got lots of plans and we're busy, busy, busy. Thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for keeping us going. We've been having so much fun doing these free programs for you and we're excited to expand our programming and welcome you into our doors in a variety of ways. So thank you, Masha, for taking the time today. Shall we go back out in the gallery and work a little bit more? We'll be ready for tonight and we'll see all of you from the public starting tomorrow. Um, these exhibitions, um, Brodovich is open through October 24th. Belarusian Paintings is open through September 12th, right? So you've got some time. We also have the Permanent Collection Gallery down in the lower, uh, which is in the lower level. Uh, so you can see a wonderful, at this moment, uh, collection, many of our socialist realist paintings, many of those are from Soviet Ukraine at the moment, it does rotate. And then a small exhibition um, in the Fireside Gallery, Small But Mighty, of Artel dolls um, made in uh, 1920s Soviet Russia. So we've got a lot to see, a lot to experience. Thanks, Masha. Any final comments? Well, just would like to thank everyone who is, who is present with us today, and we hope to see more of you on Zoom and in the museum. Thank you very much. Have a great day. We'll see you again soon.